this is a subject that I absolutely love uh, talking about. Uh, it's at the intersection of orthopedic trauma and spine. Uh, and I really, uh, you know, you don't find too many spine trauma um, sort of educational sort of forums where uh, we discuss the lumbosacral junction. And I think as time goes on, we're going to see the importance of well-informed spine involvement in the treatment of these injuries. Um, and so we will, in the next uh, couple minutes, uh, I'm going to review the spectrum of injuries that may benefit from spinal pelvic fixation. Uh, we'll try to develop a systematic uh, spine-based approach to lumbosacral trauma and really understand like the decision-making and the, uh, the questions that we have to answer to come up with a well-formulated plan. So in terms of the lay of the land, these pelvic injuries, uh, they're complex. Uh, and right now we find that uh, you know, some spine surgeons may not fully under understand the full spectrum of pelvic ring injuries that can benefit from spinal pelvic fixation. The orthopedic traumatologists are often the gatekeepers for these injuries, uh, but they often don't understand the capabilities of modern spine instrumentation. Um, and their idea of lumbopelvic fixation is really reliant on the historical literature from 20 years ago. So in terms of anatomy, uh, fundamentally the sacrum acts to transmit load from the spine to the bilateral lower extremities, much like uh, the keystone in the Roman arch. There are several classification, uh, classification systems from the orthopedic uh, sort of pelvic ring stability. We have the Young and Burgess and the Tal classification. But from the sacrum, you know, from on the spine side, we're really familiar with um, the Denise classification, the Isler classification, the Roy Camille classification. So sometimes it's easy to get burdened by so many different classification systems. So what I want you to sort of start thinking about is think of these injuries as either vertically oriented patterns. Uh, or patterns in which there's a transverse component. And if now if we have two buckets, we can really think about, well, what are the salient features of these? Um, the AO, uh, AO spine and AO trauma combine the last three, uh, so the uh, last three uh, classification systems into one universal uh, sacral classification system. And even though this looks like a busy slide, um, we still have a grouping of vertically oriented patterns and a grouping of transversely oriented patterns. <coughs> So these vertically oriented patterns, they can appear differently. Uh, you can have uh, vertical shear fractures where one of the hemi, where the hemi pelvis is sheared up. The vertical limb could be in different uh, locations relative to the sacrum, and there are different rates of neurologic injury with this. Uh, the transverse components, um, so these are all fractures that have a transverse component. The common thing amongst all of them is that the spine is disconnected from the, the pelvis, and so that low transmission to the pelvis is disrupted. Um, the, it's not just the fracture pattern, but also what's happening. So there are different rates of, kyph uh, of kyphosis or translation that are at play uh, that we need to take into consideration. And so while spinal pelvic uh, fixation has largely been limited to injuries in which there's a transverse component, uh, what I'm proposing is that the, uh, the, well, the role for spinal pelvic fixation in vertically oriented fractures is still in its infancy. And this is where I think we can really move the needle forward uh, if we commit to this as a spine community. Um, and so in terms of transverse fractures, the things that we need to consider is the sacral kyphosis, uh, the neurologic status, and whether or not the two hemipelvi are connected. Uh, in terms of sacral kyphosis, you could imagine uh, this, uh, this is a uh, patient in his 20s. He has, uh, if, he, if you acutely change, um, if you develop this much sacral kyphosis, this is the one thing that changes your pelvic incidence, which we think is otherwise as an, uh, a parameter that doesn't change. And so in order to keep his head above his hips, he, he's going to have to have, uh, you know, uh, a compensatory lumbar lordosis by the same amount, uh, which over time uh, creates a challenge. Uh, and in the long term, there are several studies that have demonstrated that uh, global sagittal malalignment uh, after these injuries have been correlated to long-term pain and disability scores. Uh, despite that, we still don't have uh, a widely accepted value uh, as to what's acceptable versus what isn't. Uh, but clearly, in a younger, more active patient, we're probably going to accept less because um, they have a, to live a whole lifetime with that new uh, deformity compared to uh, someone who's, say, more frail. The neurologic status, um, so patients may present with an acute cauda equina uh, presentation. You have the acute compression of multiple sacral nerve roots. Um, on exam, the, uh, frequently these patients are neurologically intact if you assess a motor exam uh, alone. The S1 nerve roots have already come out, so you have uh, your preserved strength to your bilateral lower extremities. The rectal exam and re perirectal sensation is critical to the assessment. If there is a deficit, this is an acute cauda equina syndrome. It's no less urgent than any other cause for cauda equina syndrome. Um, 
So uh, here's that same patient. Uh, so uh, got them corrected. Um, and we could talk about how we sort of do this, but this was an open procedure. But what I want to draw your attention to is just the difference in the resting lumbar lordosis in the malreduced one versus the one that's reduced. And this is even just only on the supine study. So you can imagine that this difference would be even greater on upright images. The issue is with these very uh, displaced um, uh, injuries that require open fixation. Uh, so this is a big problem. Um, the, there are, there's a high complication rate to the surgery, you know, and these are, uh, and these are complications that can't be avoided. You're, uh, um, you know, you're operating through a traumatized area, you're uncovering a traumatic dural tear in the majority of these, um, and you have uh, significant, uh, uh, there's a high rate of wound healing issues, but this is sort of the, the cost of treating this really bad problem with the open technique. So I'm gonna move on to sort of uh, injuries in which there's a vertical pattern. Uh, so that what we wanna consider here is where that, the proximal end of that vertical fracture sort of exits uh, relative to the L5-S1 uh, facet because that has implications for stability at the lumbosacral junction. Uh, whether or not there's vertical translation of the hemipelvis, uh, whether or not there's transitional anatomy because this has implications for your corridors for bony fixation um, and what our weight-bearing goals are. In terms of uh, L5-S1 stability, we have the Isler classification, uh, which uh, classifies uh, where that vertical limb comes up proximally relative to the L5-S1 facet. So you can see the middle one there, if you have a floating facet, if it's displaced, that's one that you would want, maybe consider a fusion for. Um, whereas, you know, the first, the image on the left there, the lumbosacral junction, the facet isn't uh, disturbed. So that would be one that uh, you don't need a fusion because the capsule is probably intact. Uh, so here's a picture of, uh, so what, what I have circled in yellow there, um, so that's a floating, that, that's a superior articular process of L5 that's out in the breeze. Uh, this was treated initially with just uh, iliosacral fixation with transiliac transacral screws. You could see the joint there on the, uh, on the outlet view. Uh, and there's the post-op CT at about six or nine months, and it's no surprise that this patient went on to develop uh, facetogenic pain that required a subsequent lumbosacral fusion. So what are our fixation options? So um, there are essentially two uh, types of instrumentation that we have for these injuries. Uh, one is our traditional iliosacral screws and then our posterior lumbopelvic fixation or spinal pelvic fixation. In terms of iliosacral screw fixation, um, the benefits are it's safe, it's minimally invasive, uh, it can be done with the patient in the prone or supine position. Um, and for these vertically oriented fractures, the orientation of the fracture is such that you could get compression across, uh, across that fracture line. And um, if you don't achieve compression across those fracture lines, there's a very high rate of a sacral non-union, which is a much, uh, it's, it's a very difficult uh, problem to address. The downside though, is it's poor at resisting shear, right? Um, you need good fluoroscopic images and you know uh, appropriate training to safely be able to put these in. And uh, for the orthopedists in the audience, there's really nowhere else in the body, with the exception of maybe the hip, where we rely on a lag screw alone uh, without neutralizing it. And it's because of this shear phenomena. In terms of lumbopelvic fixation, um, it can be minimally invasive um, if you don't need to achieve much of a reduction. There are percutaneous methods. Uh, but the main advantage is it's much superior in terms of uh, resisting flexion, extension, torsional stresses, uh, even in the setting of sacral comminution. The downside is it is more invasive than our iliosacral screws. Uh, if you cross the L5-S1 junction, um, then you limit lumbar motion. And uh, we'll talk about later about there are cases where you don't even need to. You could limit your fixation up to S1. Um, you're working through a traumatized uh, field. And so this dissection was, the, was made by the injury. Uh, it necessitates a prone position. And depending on your technique, you can have increased hardware uh, irritation. And of course, we can combine these, you know, we can combine these two uh, methods. We can use an iliosacral screw to get that necessary compression and then neutralize it. Um, and with these constructs, we can allow patients uh, to immediately weight bear. So in the polytrauma patient, immediate mobilization, there's a benefit to that. All right, so in terms of our anatomic considerations, so looking at the upper sacral segment at S1, uh, you know, we're, we're all made sort of differently. So in the non-dysmorphic um, uh, patient, you could get a, a transiliac, transsacral screw all the way across safely. 
in a patient with transitional anatomy where that S1 wants to be more uh, sort of like a, you know, a lumbar vertebra, if you try to attempt that pathway, you're going to bag the L5 nerve roots, which is uh, not good. Um, for our isolated vertical patterns, um, yeah, so these are, again, the factors that we uh, sort of, ta that I talked, you know, that we just went through. Uh, and all of these reasons, you could see that there's a potential benefit that can be derived from spinal pelvic fixation. Uh, so the questions that we need to answer to, in order to come up with a good plan are, do we need to fuse or not fuse? Are we going to do this open or percutaneous? How are we going to instrument the ilium? Uh, and is there ever the role for a cross connector? So the question to fuse or not, like really it's a simple question. So we limit our primary fusions to patients in which there's a displaced uh, superior articular uh, facet fracture. Uh, in cases where it's non-displaced, um, uh, you know, my approach has been to uh, just stabilize it, assess for union, see if it becomes a problem. And if it becomes a problem, then you, uh, you, know, then you can fuse. But the majority of the time for the non-displaced ones, they do just fine uh, with treatment of their pelvic ring injury. Uh, in terms of open for versus percutaneous, uh, so the reasons to open uh, are the need for a sacral decompression if a patient has an acute cauda equina uh, compression. If there's unacceptable sacral kyphosis that you can't correct with percutaneous methods, you need to open it to get it reduced. Uh, or if the pelvic ring is sheared vertically um, such, uh, and you need an open posterior reduction, and this is a decision that's made by um, our orthopedic traumatology colleagues. Uh, and then you can limit... Uh, fixation to percutaneous if the pelvis is already reduced and we're just simply instrumenting the pelvis to provide supplemental fixation to allow for immediate weight bearing um, uh, or for treating unstable uh, patterns that are non-displaced. The utility of a cross connector. And so uh, for those of us who do this, a lot of times our trauma colleagues will ask us to place a cross connector and we're like, well, why? Uh, and here's the rationale. Maybe. So the concern is uh, the medial lateral stability. So let's say you have this fracture here. Uh, we uh, get it reduced. Uh, and uh, let's say we decide for this construct here. The concern is that the hemipelvis uh, on the injured side could rotate about the axis of the L5 screw um, uh, and cause subsequent displacement. So how can we counter this force? So in the patient in which you have the corridor um, at the upper sacral segment, you could put a transiliac transsacral screw. Uh, in, uh, in a patient without uh, that quarter, so our trans, uh, patients with transitional anatomy, you don't have that option. Uh, and this is a case where uh, a cross connector would be helpful to resist that rotational moment. Uh, and now we're at a point, oh, uh, okay, we'll talk about. So in terms of our iliac screws, uh, the technique matters. Um, and so um, on the picture on the left there, uh, you could see that was mostly an, an iliac trajectory that was used. Uh, over here, the, it was more of a sort of an S2AI. It really doesn't matter, the bone doesn't care. Um, but what matters is where the tulip lies in relationship to the fascia. So if that tulip is prominent to the fascia, it's gonna become an issue. Patients with these significant lumbosacral dissociations, there's studies that show that they have a subsequent weight loss of 15 to 20 pounds over the first six to nine months. So something that isn't symptomatic to start can become symptomatic and cause wound breakdown. Um, and so you really want to get the tulips tucked underneath the fascia. Um, and so just uh, we'll end with a couple case examples uh, that sort of highlight different things. So this is a patient who came in with a widely displaced open book injury. Uh, this was an open injury in the sense that she had a perineal wound, uh, polytrauma patient. She had a T12 chance fracture that was uh, 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 treated by my neurosurgery colleagues. And here's the axial CT that shows that her SI joints are wide bilaterally. Um, this is the 3D CT scanner, and this is in the pelvic binder, uh, so you can imagine how wide her, uh, her, her pelvis was initially. Uh, she got provisionally uh, X-fixed uh, uh, and uh, stabilized, underwent a colostomy, a diverting colostomy for treatment of her open perineal wound, um, had her trans fracture uh, addressed by um, uh, my colleagues. And then on hospital day seven, she was uh, stable enough for us to uh, stabilize her pelvis. My, uh, one of our orthopedic traumatologists uh, fixed her. The pelvis is beautifully reduced. Uh, and this is the 3D CT scan. So you can see it's symmetric, but she remains in the anterior external fixator because there were high pubic rami fractures um, and there was an open wound. And so this was sort of felt to be um, 
uh, appropriate. So the issue is with this construct, uh, what, uh, what the weight bearing would be. And so with this, most of us who do pelvic trauma would limit her to transfers uh, on one side and not weight bearing on the other. And so I talked to her whether we can do a percutaneous procedure to uh, allow her to immediately weight bear. And she agreed to it. So uh, went up to S1, uh, just down to the ilium, tunnel the subfascial percutaneous cross connector. You can see that's the incision for both the iliac bolts. It's like four and a half centimeters for the subfascial cross connector in both iliac bolts. Um, and here's uh, her outlet. We did not cross the lumbosacral junction. We did not limit motion. Allowed her to weight bear immediately. And at three weeks, uh, she was taking steps in the hospital. At three weeks, uh, she was using a walker and walking independently at six weeks. Uh, and this is the last case, and then I'll end. Um, so here's a patient who fell from a height. Um, uh, he was initially hemodynamically unstable, stabilized um, by our uh, colleagues who responded to fluids, went to IR for embolization and the pelvic external fixator. Um, here's the position in the external fixator. So even though the pelvis is uh, not quite reduced, the fixator is doing its job. It's res helped resuscitate this patient, close down the pelvic volume. The question is, what do we do now? How do we make this look like a pelvis again? And so we just break it up into simple parts. We need to get the front lined up. We need to get this joint closed down. We need to bring this pelvis down and uh, get it compressed. Um, and so this is a, an injury that's going to be uh, managed jointly between the orthopedic trauma team and the spine team. The L5-S1 facet there, it looks intact, so we're not going to fuse. Um, and so uh, one of my colleagues uh, addressed the front, got the front reduced. Uh, you can see the wide SI joint on that side. So in the supine position, this was closed down uh, with a lag screw, uh, added for extra measure. Um, and then we, uh, this was that same picture from earlier. So this is the traumatized wound bed. Uh, and so how do we actually pull this pelvis down? And this is where as spine surgeons, we can really leverage the spine and really push off of the spine to bring the pelvis down. Um, so we attach this trauma screw uh, into L5, another one into the ilium. Use this clamp that attaches to the head of those to really push those two apart. Um, and in this uh, first floor over there, you can see that uh, the sacral ala here relative to the S1 M plate. And as you distract with the clamp, you bring it down. Uh, you get it symmetric to the other side. And then all you have to do now is just close that gap, which you can do with a clamp. Have your trauma colleague put in some screws. And then you exchange your hardware out um, for this. Um, at, uh, and so here's the pelvis again. Um, this is the 3D uh, at uh, nine months, took out the lumbo, uh, the L5 screw and the iliac bolt. Um, he regained his motion at 18 months. His main complaint was his uh, the neuropathic pain into his bilateral lower extremities. And so really we can go from this, uh, the first picture to the second picture, but it requires collaboration between uh, the orthopedic trauma team and the spine team, which means that as spine surgeons, we need to be available. We need to be part of the conversation. You can rely on spine-based reduction um, uh, reductions and spinal pelvic fixation for temporary fixation. And so there is added value to us being involved um, for these injuries, uh, and not just limited to lumbosacral dissociations, but even vertically oriented patterns. Um, we can either provide percutaneous fixation, supplemental fixation, um, and we can also help uh, for spine-based reduction techniques. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Asha, so we're gonna put a case in mind to have yes. a seat over there, and you guys have a microphone. So I'm going to show a quick case. Um, uh, when do you put in stacked or doubled iliac screws or triple? I asked uh, your partner before about image guidance, and he kind of just um, yeah. ignored that. So when do we need two or three iliac screws? Uh, I think you know with the, the mantra is always more is better. But I uh, I found that you know one long screw we settle for nothing shorter than a hundred. Um, if our implant companies can provide a one twenty, we usually put that in. Uh, you can get a hundred millimeter screw in every ilium, um, and um, usually coupled with an iliosacral screw, you're leveraging off the iliosacral screw, so you don't have much loosening. Um, all right, and so one more time, the length of these screws. So do you aim for the anti-ilioxpinous process? Do you want 120 millimeters and a 30 uh, So millimeters? yeah, you can, uh, in, in across uh, different body habits, different size pelvises, you could get a 100 millimeter screw in every one. Um, and, and so uh, that's what we're aiming for. Uh, you really want to make sure it's, uh, it extends past the uh, sciatic notch at the very minimum. Um, and so. Great. So I was going to show a quick case. Um,